Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're, dis- we're discussing maternal health support, and we're speaking to hardworking nonprofits and, and nonprofit leaders uh, and, uh, and special guests. Cindy Hernandez Cancio, Vice President for Health Justice at the National Partnership for Women and Families in Washington, D.C. Marianne Frey. CEO of Maternity Care Coalition of Pennsylvania, and Kristen Rowe Finkbeiner, Executive Director and CEO of Moms Rising Together in Washington. Thank you all for joining. It's just wonderful to have you here. We have a lot to unpack. Today is World Maternal Health Day. We want to talk with you about this underreported issue Uh, It seems that we have a 20% problem in this country. 20% of new mothers experience some type of mood or anxiety disorder in the weeks before, uh, during and after birth. And while the the CDC reports that pregnancy-related deaths among Hispanic and Black women rose 20% in just 2020, Black women have the highest death rate at 55 deaths for every 100,000 live births compared to white women whose maternal death rate is rate is roughly a third of that. And now there's a seismic shift. It's a conservative shift at the Supreme Court. It has Samuel Alito writing an opinion, removing constitutional protections for a woman's federally protected right to receive abortion services, a right supported by 62% of women and the majority of men in America. So, since, since he, if you could guide us through, what is the state of maternal health in the United States today from your uh, perspective at uh, the National Partnership for Women and Families? Thank you so much, Mark, for, especially for this invitation. So right now, um, the state of maternal health in this country is in crisis. And in fact, it has been in crisis for a long time. A lot of people might not realize that of all the industrialized nations in this country, in the in the world, um, the United States has the worst uh, maternal health outcomes. And let's not forget, especially today, that's Maternal Mental Health Day, um, that uh, so much of, in addition to the terrible maternal mortality rates, we have to estimate that about 10 times that amount um, are women who've had near misses or so severe. So, so why don't women. I see it, right? I mean, people talk about st- the statistics and we're in crisis, but I don't see it. I don't experience it. I go to well, you know, my home. I, 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 I read the newspapers. Why don't I see it as a, a, as a white guy who is a professional wearing a nice suit? Why don't I see this? Well, I think that there are the reasons for that, right? First of all, you know, you you said it yourself, you're a white guy. Um, and the crisis is especially bad in communities of color. And the other thing is that people don't realize that um, when women go through this kind of crisis of having a near miss, and I'm one example of that, I nearly died giving birth to my son. Um, and Nobody, nobody talks about it, right? Like nobody is really covering the issue of, you know, it's like, okay, you lived, good luck. <laughs> forget the trauma, forget the, like the, the, the real PTSD that you get when suddenly your cesarean incision rips open and bleeds out, bleeds out like a horror movie. Nobody, nobody is talking about that, not even within the healthcare system itself. You mean you're um, just wrapped up and sent home and, and it's basically sayonara, you know, uh, the healthcare system. Absolutely, itself. absolutely. And I was a person who, for my example, I had like what they call Cadillac health insurance. I got sent home septic and back back in the ER three hours later and almost died, right? This is not an outlier, right? This is not an outlier. And and lately, you know, if you read stories about what Beyonce went through, what Serena Williams went through, you know, we're starting to get more attention to this, um, but they're still being treated as like, oh, that's like a worst case scenario, as opposed to that is the actual result of generations of decision making that have been done in this country um, that minimize women's pain, that minimize women's health. And, you know, a million times over, if that woman happens to be brown or black. So if I if I happen to not have health insurance and I'm, I, I experienced what you experienced, I'm I'm, I'm dead. 
Yeah, that's very possible. That's very possible. But the thing about the maternal health crisis, uh, and this is very um, a lot, something that a lot of people don't know, is that people like to conflate in this country because they're afraid to talk about racism, um, that, oh, well, those are socioeconomic factors. Oh, they had pre-existing conditions. We heard of that during COVID as well, right? Um, and the truth of the matter is that, especially when it comes to maternal health, a Black woman cannot earn or educate herself out of the crisis, right? Um, black women have worse outcomes. Uh, educated black women have worse outcomes than white women who haven't graduated from high school. So you can't come and say this is just a question of, you know, trying to figure out the, so the, the economic factors. This is about something very, very perverse um, and pervasive in our healthcare system. And why is that? Is there a reason that, and I saw you nodding when uh, mm -hmm. the point about educated Black women have worse health, health, health. Is there a reason for that? Um, I think that Cincy really referred to it. It's, it's structural racism. You know, when you were talking, Cincy, I, and I actually thought about an experience that my, my sister, my sister and my mom had, which punctuates the truth of what you just said. So in 1955, in Jim Crow South, the Alabama, Alabama, my sister, my mother was, you know, went to the doctor to have my sister and it was segregated South. And she, my mom had the choice of going a hundred miles to go to a integrated hospital or to a nearby doctor that didn't have all the, you know, bells and whistles and they were missionaries. So they didn't have a lot of the Cadillac insurance that you're referring to, but luckily you know, they chose to go to my, to the local doctor and rest, she rests, she didn't hemorrhage or have any of those post birth kind of out, uh, negative outcomes. But what was that all about? What did that do to my mom? What did that do to her? She's a physician today committed to making sure that that doesn't happen. But to your point, Mark, these are traumatic experiences that are built into the fabric of this country. So we um, talk about systematic racism. Sure. A lot, until it, it becomes a term devoid of meaning, even the people who who uh, believe in systematic racism sometimes can't unpack it. Sure. So is this really about the the issue of understanding the uh, particular needs that black women have versus women of another race or, or white women? Or is it a are these these sort of subtle building up of of little issues, a little bit more of a delay, this, this uh, complete myth about um, uh, uh, people of different races having different pay, pain thresholds, right? I mean, that's... that's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's sick. It's it so so is, is it a bunch of little things? It is, is it a particular systematic thing? Is it uh, ignorance in terms of different needs? Uh, what is, I would, what I would, is systematic I would, racism in this case? I, I essentially is like dying to respond. It's much more insidious. I do not think it's it's very, um, you know, happenstance. It is incredibly systematic. And if you talk about what we were discussing prior to coming online about Ukraine, about Belarus, was that very, was that happenstance? You, we all discussed this whole dynamic between the dominant white supremacy and what happened and how it is incredibly insidious and it's very intentional. So is it, I would- is it, is it intentional in all cases or is it also- no. No. So I think it's really important to break this down a little bit more because it's not a bunch of little things. It's literally hundreds of years of big things yes. along with the little things. And there's a level of what is like the, the hierarchy of human value that is yes. embedded in decision making right mm -hmm. and then there's also the fact that there's implicit bias right and the fact that there's especially when it comes to birthing a hell of a lot of implicit of implicit and extremely explicit um patriarchy right mm -hmm. of women being told that their pain isn't real of women being told you know this is something that has been well documented so you're saying it's partially a, a male attitudinal issue uh, as yeah the, but more uh, than the male attitudinal issue more than the male attitudinal issue it's the fact that for years and like we know the the impact of racism and traumatic stress now at the level of that it changes your dna right when yeah, you weathering. Right. It's the weathering hypothesis. When you are sure. going 
going sure. through trauma all the time um, yeah. and you're doing dealing with post-traumatic stress, but without the post, right? Um, mm-hmm. That actually affects the physiology in ways yep. that make you much more likely to have the, some of the chronic conditions that ended up making things worse for COVID, end up making mm-hmm. things worse for birth. That's and true. that is a, that is that is both. And then on top of that, there is increase. There, there have been government decisions and private sector decisions that lay on, you know, tons and tons of health risk in certain communities Mm -hmm. and take away a lot of the health resources from communities. So that's a perfect storm for the disaster that we are in. Um, Kristen, into this, Kristen, um, are you finding that that really I know we're going to talk a little bit more about about um, how maternal health needs has, has evolved recently and how it needs to continue to evolve. Kristen, do you find that in, in your work um, that the need is, is so uh, thoroughly concentrated in particular communities as well at Moms Rising? And, and describe a little bit about the kind of services that you provide. I just want to start out by plus wanting everything Marianne and Lindsay have just said. This conversation is so important, and I want to uplift some of the stats that were just brought out. Maternal health is in crisis in the United States of America. We are the only World Health Organization country that has increasing maternal deaths, and Black women are dying two to three times as often as white women. Increasing maternal deaths. Yes, and we just had an increase in the last year. This is outrageous. It's reprehensible. It cannot stand. And as we're talking about right now, there's no single silver bullet solution to this, but we have to try to get to solutions through multiple ways. One of the ways with 100 other experts right now who are experts in maternal health, would they all be saying the same thing? Oh, absolutely. They all be saying that the numbers do not lie. The numbers are very clear. There is no, you know, vagueness in the numbers. They, they may focus more on one thing or another, but the big picture they'd all agree on for yeah. sure. Yeah, we have a crisis in America. We have a crisis of structural racism. We have a crisis of maternal health and morbidity. We have a crisis of infant mortality as well, because when we're talking about this, we're also talking about a whole family crisis. Other numbers, we're talking about numbers that don't lie. One of the things that we're looking at right now is the ways for solutions. So in the Congress right now, there's something called the Momnibuster that is moving forward that does look at many aspects that can be legislated to address structural racism and health inequities in our systems. So that's moving. Another thing that's moving forward is the Pregnancy Fairness Act. Why is that important? What other numbers need to be brought into this room? Well, the other numbers that can be brought into this room is the fact that being a mom is a greater predictor of wage and hiring discrimination than gender. And moms of color are experiencing challenges. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Say that again. Being yeah. a mom is a greater predictor of wage and hiring discrimination in the United States of America than gender. And here's the important part. That's not even the important part. Being a mom the important is- part is that moms of color due to structural racism are experiencing compounded wage and hiring discrimination to the extent that, and here's a place that we need to focus on the numbers that shows the intersectional impact of discrimination in America. Latina moms are earning just 46 cents to a white dad's dollar and black moms are earning just 52 cents to a white dad's dollar. Moms of all races and ethnicities combined overall are earning just 72 cents to dads of all races. So this is not okay. This is a point where we can look at what's happening. We can look at people who are dying, people who are losing wages, people who are having families in crisis. And then we can look at the flip side of what happens when we have equity. We all are better off. We are lives saved. We are more people who are thriving. We want to build together a nation where everyone can thrive. And we must stop the structural racism, this implicit bias, and uh, women and moms from dying. Is this where now- sy- systemic difference really intersects? So in a sense, Kristen's uh, whole statistic, and Kristen, that was just fabulous. That was the aria, aria from Aida. Um, <laughs> so... Um, but what, what Kristen's basically saying is that we've got a multiply systemic issue, right? We have a systemic tilt against women, against moms, and based in race, right? So, so you have- Wait, I, of- I need to correct you because we need to stop that narrative yeah. that it's based in race. 
It is not based in race. It is based in racism, right? The mm. fact that I have a different race or ethnicity is not the issue. It's it's what it means to walk around in this country. Oh, it's the atti- it's the attitudinal. Well, that's 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 what I meant. But uh, but thank I, you. I know, I know. But we we all need to do the, our our work um, because mm. it, 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 we saw this in, in the pandemic, right? Where people are like, oh, that's because those races, you know, gen- you know, inherently have higher risk factors. No, that there are a few things where race, your actual race and your genetics make a difference. But in what we're talking about, that's that that's not it. That's not it at all. So how important is is that is addressing health disparity? Because there's a there's a piece of this that's really about everybody's attitude. Mm. Right. It's it's also about the structures that have been built through history and, and correcting them. It's about language. There are all these different different aspects. But providing health and equalizing that playing field has a palpable impact because as you each have said that if you can deal with the health disparities you're you're also helping people to uh, to up their game in terms of their income generation right um, the expenses go down for for health care and so on so to what extent is is the provision of services to to women maternal uh, requiring maternal health is that actually a multiplier effect in the lives of each of these women and and throughout our society marianne i'm gonna i'm gonna move it over to you and then i'm gonna come over to you Cincy. yeah you know i was thinking as you were talking is that payment um reimbursement reform payment reform on insurance could address some of these issues so we're incentivizing doctors or me- medical providers i should say to um to only deliver certain types of care. So Medicaid with 53% of the births in at least Pennsylvania are, are covered by Medicaid. We just had a successful um, extension, postpartum extension for Medicaid beyond 12 months, would be on six months, and that was critical. But if you think about what it means to not have insurance coverage postpartum or prenatally, that is, a, we can unpack that all afternoon to really figure out, like that is a, a lever that, a factor that is, is impacting birth outcomes, et cetera. So if we were to change that somehow and to have, instead of have insurers be paid for services, have them be paid for birth out for outcomes. And um, that's something that I think is really missing in, in our medical system right now. And that, you know, and I invite others to, to kind of build on that. But that is one of the things that many of the collaboratives that MCC is involved with, I know we're working with uh, Moms Rising and other organizations, is to really beat that drum. We have got to fix the way that we have providers. And it's so uncoordinated. Our structures are not designed to deal with the whole person. It is very segmented and it's uncoordinated. And that leaves so many gaps. And that's why moms and birthing people are dying. Because either they one don't of the have systemic it. changes that you want is you want healthcare to move from transactional to holistic models, and you so, want the reimbursement systems to uh, be a, a reimbursement system that focuses on what is best for the mother. Correct. And and what you're what you're actually saying is that the transactional healthcare might work for men. I don't know if it does, frankly, but when you're talking about the health, the holistic health of the child. And I don't mean to put holistic in front of it, in front of this, as if it, it, it's some magical word. But I'm, I'm saying that that this dynamic between yeah. mother and child is, and and you know from birthing and so on and so forth is so sensitive that making it transactional builds in perverse behaviors mm-hmm. and attitudes. Is yeah. that's what mm. you're saying? So yes, the systemic thing that we need to think about because. When it comes to mothers and children, we've always recognized as a society this is that it's different. Uh, Cincy and then uh, Kristen, could you comment on that, and, and particularly in the relationship to your, to the work of your organizations? Because we want to draw yeah. attention to so, the so Mark, contribution that you each make. So, Mark, mm-hmm. I would love to have you invite us to have a conversation specifically about how we get to a, a payment and delivery system that actually is equitable and high quality, mm-hmm. because that is a whole other thing to unpack. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like my favorite thing to talk about. But that would I did, be great. you know, if we could, we could invite some insurance industry, and I'm, I'll really think about this. Um, yeah. 
uh, we'll, I'll talk it over re- with Rhea Titus, who is who is uh, running this. But yeah, uh, yeah. there's a lot of um, interesting work happening right outside. now on the federal level about that. But I did I did want to highlight a couple of things. One is that, you know, for a country that is apparently really interested in um, in the lives of babies, um, we really ha- don't have a, a, a country that supports the actual lives of babies r- once they're not connected um, to their mother's wombs, right? So let's that's one thing that I think is an opportunity right now for us to be talking about. The other thing is about how how improving the health of people of color and especially moms and babies um, helps everyone. One statistic that's important for all of us to hear is that right now in our schools, the majority of children are children of color. Let me say that again. Right now in our schools, the majority of children are children of color. We don't have a lot of time to make sure they're healthy so that they can pay their taxes and pay into Medicare. And Mm. and so we are not going to thrive as a nation unless we get this right now. Right. And so that's a huge motivator that people don't like to talk about. But as far as the kind of systemic things, in addition to the issue of like we need everybody to have insurance. Right. Um, as long as insurance is a requirement for healthcare in this country. But in addition to that, we, ha- we need to make sure that the insurance they have actually gets them something that's high quality that they need. Mm. Right. Because insurance is a lot like a cell phone. It's only as good as the network it's on. And in our mm. community, the networks, pardon my French, often suck. Um, and the other thing that we know is that it's very clear that when when, for example, when babies, infants are cared for by when black infants are paid are cared for by black pediatricians are more likely mm-hmm. to live. Right. We also have a rural urban uh, division in this country in which we yeah. have huge swaths of the country have the, the these real deficits. So we, we don't really have a have a rational um, uh, a system. Uh, uh, Kristen, could you comment on that? And how do we make this system more rational? I mean, we can't just we can't just beat people over the head. Right. We, we do have to change some of the incentives here. But how do we how do we do this? Um, because uh, uh, the result of the poll that we just took, in which we asked whether you know who should pay for all this, and basically uh, the the idea was that um, mothers and children, everybody who responded, said we should either have private insurance or the public purse. Right? It was a, it was a mix. It was about uh, 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 two thirds of those responded said that public purse, um, a third said uh, uh, private insurance uh, mostly, but also even there, they, they allowed that it was, that it should be public uh, purse as well for people in need. And then nobody selected only private insurance. There were a few people who just didn't know. How do we go about these changes in a way that, that accelerates change in the face of an increase in maternal um, deaths during during this time. Kristen? We need a lot of changes. We need not <laughs> just one change, but we need several policy areas to move together because we are behind the rest of the world when it comes to having a care infrastructure. What Cincy just said about not really caring about, bothering about, paying attention to what happens as soon as the baby leaves the womb to the mom and to the baby is so important. We lack a care infrastructure. And let's just pause on that for a moment. In the United States of America, we do not have any national paid family medical leave program. Every other industrialized nation has this. Over 177 countries have this. We do not. That is one key way that we can also lower maternal mortality and infant mortality. When we look at who does have this, we have 11 states who have this critical policy in place, and we have some companies have this. All told, 23% of people in the United States of America have this policy. However, only 8% of low-wage workers have access to this policy. That's key. We need equitable access to all national workplace structural policies. We need structural change. Now, when we look at what's the care infrastructure, the care infrastructure is building things like access to affordable childcare. Childcare costs more than college. So parents can go to work. So children can thrive. And so care workers can earn earn living wages. And so our economy can bloom. It includes things like the child tax credit, which we just had for one year, fully refundable. And it brought 40% of children in the United States of America out of poverty for that one year, the largest one year drop in poverty in the history of our nation. Then we let it go. 
We have yeah. proof positive that policies mm-hmm. like are in the Momnibuster that go for equitable internal health, that policies like paid family medical leave, child care, and more with health care actually help lower the wage gaps between moms and non-moms, help lower costs to our country. You're talking about who pays, what's the cost. When we have paid family medical leave, studies show that there is a 40% drop in the need for SNAP, which is food stamps, and TANF, which is government support. So we help taxpayers save dollars. We save lives in health care. We lower the wage gaps between moms and non-moms. We help get at some of that structural racism. We need to do a lot of work to deal with structural racism, not just this. Um, and we help move our country forward. So we do know solutions are possible. They're moving through Congress. They're moving through state legislatures. We need everybody who's watching, who's listening to double down on standing up. At Moms Rising, we say, please text we care one word, to 747464 and tell your U.S. senators we'll connect you with with that to get moving on the mom to bus, get moving on paid family medical leave, on paycheck fairness, on ending pregnancy discrimination, on child care. We can do it all. Now, some people say you have issues. Yes, we have issues. But as the very famous, great and beloved Audrey Lord said, we don't leave sing- we don't live single issue lives, so we don't have a single issue struggle. We can do many things at the same time. And in fact, we regularly do. And we need to do all of these things and more. Um, so that's my short answer or my long answer to your short question. <laughs> well, I have a question for you all because, and I, this is going to sound like a stupid question, uh, but um, I've got to ask it anyway. When when these, it, t- it takes such an uphill climb to get these things passed to solve real problems. Why would anybody oppose this? Is this an issue of, uh, yeah, but I don't want to pay for it, Right. Is that what it comes down to? Or is there a power dynamic that shifts um, that, you know, people don't want to give up power? Uh, what's going on? Why is this Why is this uh, difficult? And I'm, I'm really asking because I really have no clue. Uh, Marianne, what do, you th- what do you think's going on here that this is such an uphill climb? Because it seems like, you know, even if it's not somebody in my family, I want moms and kids to do well in this country. We're so incredibly short-sighted, Mark, and I'm certain that Sensi and Kristen will, will, you know, back this up and have the statistics. What MCC does is we are the voice of the voiceless, and that is why the answer I gave before led with a personal story. We are working with families every day that live with the lives behind the statistics that Cincy, Cincy and Kristen were talking about. But why it, it's not changed is because we don't have a coalition of the willing. People want what they want. And we have a greedy, self-serving power structure. And again, I'm going right back to that whole, we were talking about Belarus and Ukraine and white supremacy. Nobody wants to give up the power and they don't care about the human value, the, the lives, the lives that we are talking about, that we care about, that MCC serves. Um, there's such a devaluation of that. So you know, I don't have all these wonderful. But I don't think that you. I don't think that your prosperity hurts me. Well, you know, that's the that's the thing. It does. It to me, it doesn't make sense because you, as a black woman, being healthy, that's not going to hurt me, right? Let, you, as a black me. woman, being able to work, hell, I could hire you, or you <laughs> could hire me, right? You could create a job, and I could be your employee, right? I mean, I I don't I don't get it. I don't get how. That's that's something I should be afraid of. Um, and since you right. But let me just respond back to Mark and then I'll go right to you. And, and what I would say back to you, Mark, is think about the your parents and the things that you said that your grandparents that, that fled. Right. Belarus. Why did those dominant? Why did those people do that? Did Were they thinking about the. Well, there was a choice, right? Death or not dying, right? But, but, but <laughs> I'm trying. Very, very to, yep, yep. But what I'm trying to say is, you're describing things in a rational sense. But what is driving this is an incredible self. Um, it, it's it's a power imbalance, and I and I really can't address it without s- stating the very obvious is that it's not about whether I could give you a job or you could. It, it, that's not it. It's it's about. I, if I'm a white male from way back when I have privilege, I am blind to what you, another person, I just don't get it. You said you don't get it, but I'm telling you, 
that it is baked into the culture and psyches of so many of us. And let me tell you something, it's baked into a lot of black and brown people too. So in many because respects, because, because I, I'm, I'm white, because I'm male, because I'm not a woman, it's, it's, I, it's, I'm not paying attention to, to, to this. Yeah. But it's, I really, it's, I really it's ought insidious. to be. If I, I really ought. I really ought to be. If I if I look at myself and I'm thinking, I'm a good person. Yeah, yeah. But you I'm have not to sensitive. work at being a good. You have to work at being a good person, which means that I have to be aware of some of uh, of Kristen's statistics, and I have to think, well, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? But it. But it's more insidious. It's even more insidious, and I would even say evil than that, right? And I think I want to. I want to elevate two things. I love being called <laughs> evil at that. <laughs> No, 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 not you. I'm talking, yeah. about the, I'm talking about the system, not not you. Yes. Um, and that is number one. Number one, the medical industrial complex um, is a for profit uh, venture. Right. That is extracted. Right. People literally make money off of other people's suffering like that's it's this is not revolutionary that is the business model right and so when we're talking about how do we change the kind how care is paid for um and rather than <coughs> rather than doing what we do now which is like or pay for you know we pay for volume like doctors will keep doing things and doing things and doing things and doing the most expensive things because they will get paid for it rather than really like paying for value. What is actually going to help that person in that moment? And guess what? Not all of it is clinical. A lot of it is a non-clinical support mm -hmm. and, a, mm -hmm. and not all of it is within these big uh, healthcare conglomerates. It's in birth centers, it's in home mm. births, it's in doulas. And so that is a threat. And in fact, you know, the even having midwives, doctors right now, AMA, though folks like that, they see it as a threat, right? So there are issues that are baked into that. But the other thing that I think is really important to elevate is is the fact that, you know, how many people right now, this this debate about um getting rid of student debt are like, I didn't I had to pay my debt. That's not fair for someone else to get it, get it free. Poll after poll is showing that this is how Americans think. If I had to do something and I figured it out, then everyone else should be able to do it without even thinking about, you know, that cost. It's almost like, you know, it's almost like going into a fraternity and being hazed, right? Like you need to, if I went through this suffering, you're all going to go to the suffering. And if you're not able to tolerate that suffering because you have a lot less to start with, too bad. They don't want to. Also, see. the costs are, are so different. You know, we're going to have to have another discussion. I can already see this. And the next discussion, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to bar any discussion of, of, of this show's topic or dominant topic. And we're going to uh, focus on uh, practical uh, health care measures. And we will okay. dive more deeply into some of the, the, these legislative initiatives. But, Kristen, we're going to give you the last word. Tell us what we should do, what we should do, what action we should take. Um, beyond dialing a number and, and making a contribution, but but I'm, I'm really serious. Let's say we didn't even know your organization in our personal lives, in our thinking, what kind of change should we start in ourselves, in our personal lives, in order to change this situation? Kristen? Well, first, make sure that you get involved and follow the Maternity Care Coalition and the National Partnership for Women and Families to get ongoing details about how you can get involved. This is a long fight. This is not gonna happen overnight. And so making sure that you're staying in touch with what's happening, with the opportunities for change, with the levers of change that you can help make happen is really important because we've talked about a lot needs to change. So get involved again with the Maternity Care Coalition, with the National Partnership for Women and Families. Moms Rising obviously also works on this and supporting as many organizations as possible that are working on this and paying attention is important too. The second thing is check your blind now, this is really important. When we're looking at what's happening in the United States of America, a lot is being made invisible, overlooked, and people are dying. And so when we are engaged in this, stories are very, 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 very important. So feel confident in sharing your story about what's happened to you with pregnancy, childbirth, and having children. And also importantly, in listening very closely to the stories of people around us and our communities who are often rendered invisible 
That is also really important. And I want to share that stories do three things. Stories tell people that we're not alone. We've talked about this. This is an invisible crisis. It's framed as an epidemic of personal failures. It's framed as moms, particularly moms of color, doing something wrong. That is not true. In other words. When this many people are having the same type of crisis at the same time, we don't have an epidemic of personal failures. We have structural issues that we can and must address, and we can and must address structural racism in the United States of America. So stories do that. Stories also tell the media what's going on because the media often overlooks as well. And stories help change public policy. They're a big wake up call to our Congress who frankly do not look like the United States of America. We don't have political parity yet. So take your blinders, check your blinders, read other people's stories, join the Maternity Care Coalition, join the National Partnership for Women and Families, get involved with Moms Rising and stay involved in the long haul. What a concept, Do, doing the right things for moms and kids. Mm. What a concept. Isn't this part of, uh, of, of our founding principles? Isn't this embedded mm. in every single religious and humanistic uh, tradition that we have? I'd like to thank you all. I know you're going to be reluctant guests to our next show, but can I get a commitment to, to come back and let's continue the discussion? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Cincy Hernandez Cancio, Vice President for Health Justice at the National Partnership for Women and Families in DC. Marianne Frey, CEO of Maternity Care Coalition in Pennsylvania. And Kristen Rao Finkbeiner, Executive Director and CEO at Moms Rising Together in Washington. You are just so wonderful. Thank you for educating me. Uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge. Please thank your staffs, your donors, your constituents, uh, and, and all the people who support your cause. Uh, we are going to have another uh, wonderful show uh, on Tuesday, this one about supporting military service and families during National Military Appreciation Month, uh, and that's coming on next Tuesday. And everybody stay safe, and we'll see you all again uh, quite soon to continue this important discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care.